Amen. Amen. How we doing today? Amen. Hey, uh, I want to hit a couple of things before we dive into the word. The, the first is um, I want to just take a moment and continue. How many of you know that, that service from beginning to end is worship? Like showing up, that's worship. Music, we get to worship. Preaching, you better believe that's worship. The offering, that's worship. It's worship from beginning to end. So uh, I just want to highlight a couple of things. We're going to take a moment and we're going to pray and we're going to unite our faith with strength. And we're going to pray that the aggression in Ukraine is stopped. I ask, I'm asking for your faith. This is, this is a very severe moment. We need to pray for our president. We need to pray for, for the world leaders. And uh, we need to pray for the country of Ukraine and the believers that are there. Uh, Ukraine has one of the largest messianic uh, places. It, there, there has been a revival among Jewish people seeing Jesus as the Messiah in Ukraine. And, uh, and so we want to we wanna lift up the church in Ukraine. We want the church in Ukraine to know we were not asleep at the wheel when this moment happened, that we're going to be interceding and praying for them and on behalf of, uh, yeah. So, uh, but, but practically, uh, I, got a, I got a text today from, from one of the leaders at Convoy of Hope, and they are actively working, helping to evacuate believers uh, through their contacts there. And so many of you give monthly to Kingdom Builders, and Convoy of Hope is one of our partners. And so when crisis moments come up like this, that, that we don't have to take a special offer, and we don't have to stop and say, hey, we need, to, we need to get some funds together, that right away we have funds that we have been sending, and so we, we are in activation immediately. And, uh, and so I want you to know that. And, and then I want you to hear from me, just thank you. Thank you for being faithful in tithes and offerings. This last year, we saw our, our, our largest year of tithes and offerings. How awesome is that? Come on. And uh, that, that speaks to the way that, that God's people just simply obey Him. It's not about being... Um, emotionally moved to do something. It's just simple obedience to God. And, uh, and so let's take a minute and let's, let's pray together and let's unite our faith, both in a moment of, of giving. And if you came prepared to give, there's envelopes in front of you. There are many ways that you can give. You can give online. You can give through the Ocean Church app. But let's unite our faith that God would move in Ukraine. And so God is your people we come to you today and we ask, Lord, that by your hand you would intervene. Lord, we ask for peace. We pray for peace. Lord, we pray that the aggression in Ukraine would stop. Lord, we pray that your voice and your, your, your church would know and see your mighty hand moving on their behalf. God, we pray strength and protection over, over that country, over the believers. God, thank you for the ones that have stayed and are there ministering in obedience to you. God, we ask that you would meet them, fill them with strength and encouragement. Lord, we pray for peace in Jesus' name. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. There is no peace without you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would be seen, you would be known and your voice would be heard in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. 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 Praise God. All right, if you would, would you, would you stand with me? We are concluding the, this series enough, and our keynote verse is found in Colossians chapter 2, and I want to read this, and then I've got five pages of notes this weekend, so we're, we're getting in. We're going. <laughs> we're going for it. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, so you also are complete. Everyone say complete. complete. You are complete through your union with Christ who is the head over every ruler and authority. Holy Spirit as only you can speak to every heart. 
Lord, I pray that, that this weekend would, re would represent a change in identity. Lord, for those who identity, whose identity is found in other places and other things, Lord, today there would be a moment of repentance where our identity would be found forevermore in you. Lord, thank you that we are complete in our identity in you. We are complete in you. Speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm excited to, to get to preach. So appreciative of Pastor Phil sharing on how Jesus is enough in singleness this last weekend. And, and just that, that reality that singleness is a blessing. It's a wonderful thing that God, God meets us in. Singleness does not mean that you have missed God. I thought there'd be a better amen. <laughs> and, and how he meets us in every season of life. Um, Anna and I had the weekend, and uh, we took a little staycation and, and took last weekend, and we're in Orlando, and went to some, some parks there, and, um, and, and I, am, I am saved again. I, I sometimes, I don't know how you are in parks, but I get in those places, and, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, Jesus, I thought I was so much holier <laughs> than I am acting right now. So what we've, we've talked about every week, we've talked about the reality of these two truths. Number one, I am not enough. This is a truth that finds us in our lives as we, as we walk through life and we, we find our, 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 our moments in the places of self-reliance where our identity is found in who we are and what we can do, somehow uh, those things come head to head with this blatant truth, I'm not enough. Uh, marriage is, is a wonderful place, and it's also a place that gets you to this reality very quickly. And, uh, and so in this place, we learn, I am not enough. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and the insults, hardships, persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the truth is, we are not enough, but the, the, the wonderful truth is Jesus is. Jesus is enough. He's, he's enough in every season. And you are complete. You and I are complete through our union with Christ. I want to go back to the book of Genesis where uh, really, the, the foundation of the lie of, of incompleteness outside of Christ began. Genesis 1 and 2, we find God creates the world. He creates man and woman. How many of you know that, that he didn't create the woman as, as, as um, a lesser vessel? She did not come from the back of Adam. She did not come from uh, the, the foot of Adam. She came from the side of Adam. God declaring that, that the value system is set, that, that you and I before God, man and woman, equal walking with God. And so he creates man and woman, and then he says these wonderful things, it is good. He looks at creation, he looks at humanity, and he says, it is good. And then we find that, that after God has spoken this, you, you find a challenge to this truth. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, and this is the place of emphasis, did God really say? Because the thing about Satan, his strategy has not changed from this moment. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it is only the, truth from the, fr the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die. So entertaining this thought, then blatant lie. You won't die, the servant replied to the woman. God knows your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced she saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. 
So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her, her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed, sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So we have this moment. God says it is good, and the enemy comes, and he said, did he really say that? And here we, we, we have this understanding that the, the expression, the action of sin comes from this root of fear that what God has provided and what he has said and what he has given is not enough. Sin comes from this place of being convinced that, that even though God said it, even though he said it's good, but the boundaries that I've given you to live in, this garden where I've said you, can, you are, are to tend and keep it, it's going to be work, but it's going to be good work. You're going to struggle here. It's going to be great. You can touch and eat from any other tree in the garden except that right there. And somehow the enemy pushes on that and says, hey, did he really mean that? I think that he's trying to keep something from you. I, I think there's happiness that he's trying to keep from you on the other side of his boundaries. And we have this fear that is acted upon. The action of sin comes from this fear. It comes from this belief that what God has said is good, is not absolute, is not truth. And so I, I want to finish our series talking about that Jesus is enough in the struggle. And we could talk about a lot of different struggles. I, I, I've already been open about, and I, I wasn't kidding. Like, we got through the weekend, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, Lord, I really thought I was farther along in my walk with you. What is it about Orlando and parks and family and being in a van for way too long and traffic? And so we could, we could spend the rest of our time talking about that struggle. But I, I want to talk and, and I want you to, to, to be open to the Lord in talking about the struggle that, because the Bible talks about the struggle of sexual purity differently. It, it talks about sexual sin differently. Where all sin comes out of this place of believing that, that what God has said is good and that what God has provided is not enough, sexual sin is not treated the same as the other sin that we find in the Word of God. And so I want to I wanna focus on that because it has been a place of shame and weakness for so many believers. You know, it's interesting, Adam and Eve have this moment and, and they begin to hide from God. Their eyes are open and they realize, oh my gosh, I'm, we're, we're naked and, 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 and we, we're ashamed. And, and so they're hiding. And, and God comes to them, and, and you know, God doesn't ask a question because he doesn't know the answer. He, he asks a question so that we know the answer. And he asks Adam and Eve this question. He comes to them and he says, hey, uh, who told you you were naked? And this is the question that he is asking us today in our society, in our culture. Who told you that you had to go outside of what I have provided to be enough. Who told you you were naked? Who lied to you and told you that you needed to act, act outside and live outside of my word to be complete? Who told you that you were naked? Paul says this, and, and, and I've broken this into four places. Number one, we're going to focus on, on, on sexual sin and talk about it because the struggle is real. This is a reality. It would be a disservice to you. I would not be faithful to you as a pastor if we never talked about this. The struggle is real. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says this, run from sexual sin. You know, it doesn't even say, hey, put on the full armor of God. Get dug in. Get ready to fight. It doesn't say any of that. What does it say? It says run. Paul says flee. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Now, the vehicle of, of receiving the, the, the truth of the Word of God and how the Word of God des describes and defines what sexual immorality is 
That vehicle is, is given um, what, what John 1 says, grace and truth. John 1, talking about the coming of Jesus, John says this, he says, of his grace we have received. This is a, a wonder that, that is grace upon grace. And he, and he says, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, you have the truth of the word of God, the truth of the boundaries that God has given mankind and the grace of God to walk it out. And here's the reality that it is our responsibility to live with grace and truth. Truth without grace is mean. And grace without truth is meaningless. Both of these are given to us. Jesus steps into our world and you know what he does? He doesn't take Mosaic law and not only fulfill it, but he takes Mosaic law and then he raises the standard for what holiness looks like. And he says, hey, you've heard it said in Mosaic law that, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, if you look at, at a woman with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. What does he do? He comes after all of our hearts. He comes after all of us. This is what Jesus does. And he comes after our hearts with the truth of the word of God, the holiness of God, and the grace that meets us in failure after failure. And so I want to speak from that, and I, I want to present to you just two agendas that, that are available for us to pick up. Now, I, I have friends that, that are, that are in a, in a, in a same-sex relationship, in a same-sex lifestyle, and you know what? I'm so thankful that, that God has graced my life to be in these friendships. And for so long, the church has not been a safe place to walk with people that they would know the grace of God, that they would know that God has a plan for you. And, and really, there's been an agenda that's been carried. And particularly with, this, with the, the same-sex community, that, that there's been this agenda that's been carried that, that the church has been a mouthpiece of saying things like this, you can't be born that way. It's very, very interesting that somehow we, we've qualified sin nature in a way that we're okay with some sins being part of sin nature, but other sins not. We've said things like, well, that, that only happens because of abuse or even things like pedophilia. And it, we've wounded We've wounded and we've given a Heisman where the grace of Jesus says, no, come to me. You know what Jesus said to those that were despised and rejected? Zacchaeus, he looked at Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. He didn't say, Zacchaeus, hurry, get home, clean it up, put all your porn away, fix it all because the Son of God's coming to your house. What, what, what do we have in Jesus? We have grace and truth. And, and this agenda that, that has been carried ha, has led us to this place where, where we have sins that are, that are more acceptable than other sins. And we can, we can have this, this unspoken place of saying, hey, there's some things. And, and you know, like everybody goes through the times and, and you go through those times, you sow your wild oats and you live wild for a time. And, and we're comfortable with that as long as it's heterosexual. And without realizing it, we, we eliminate and close a pathway for the work of God and the process of God in people. And I want Ocean Church to be a healing place. God has created, he is, has birthed this church to be a healing place for every single person who walks through the trauma of life. And so if you're waiting for me to make some, some blatant, you know, blatant statement of, of what do we believe, then this is what I'm going to say. If you have questions, I invite you to sit down with me. I invite you into a relationship. I invite you because what I'm going to do and what our church is going to do is say, I'm going to lead you to Jesus. 
I'm going to point you to Jesus. And his work is a cleansing work. His work is a purifying work. And his work is a thorough and complete work. We're going to invite into that place. That's one agenda. The other agenda that I, that I want to make us aware of is an agenda that has been carried by our culture. And it is one that is spoke to and it's spoken to with, with such strength. And it, and it sounds like this, that, that if you have a desire, then it's wrong not to follow that desire. That you're being untrue to yourself if you have a desire. And it's okay to indulge it as long as it's not, you know, too damaging to other people. You say, well, why do you say too damaging? Because I, I don't know how we qualify damaging. And I'll give you a good example. The same voices that, that say uh, pornography is normal and it's something that's to, to be expected are the same voices that are saying, well, we, we don't like this sex trafficking thing. And if you try to separate those two things, I'll just say it, you can't. You can't do it. And so the, the, the voice of culture, the voice of our society will say these things that, that you need to indulge in what you desire. To deny your desires is unhealthy. And that your identity is found in your sexuality. And what we have is what Paul talked about in the, in, in the book of Romans chapter 1, when identity is found and rooted in sexuality and desires rather than Christ, only confusion follows. The way of Jesus invites us out of both of these agendas. The way of Jesus that is full of grace and full of, full of truth invites us out of both of these places. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live, and here's the parallel, in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion, like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Holiness and honor, not in lustful passion. John describes the, the, the way of the world in, in three separate sins. He says it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This feeling based, I am going to make decisions so that I feel good. And here, here's the reality. You know, the book of Hebrews, tell, Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 5 says, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered through the things that he suffered. And the writer of Hebrews isn't simply talking about the, the cross, he's talking about the process of God that Jesus embraced. Do you realize that in the temptations of Christ that when after 40 days he, he's weak and he, his body is weak and Satan comes to him and, and what Satan paints in front of him, it would look like everything he came to earth to do. It would look like Worship from everyone, seen as the Son of God, lifted up high, miraculous, provided for. All of those things are in front of him. You know what Jesus said? He said, no, even if it looks good, it doesn't include the cross. It doesn't include the struggle. God's process includes the struggle. Second thing I want us to know, so the first is the struggle's real. The second is Jesus knows my struggle. And he knows it in two ways. Number one, he, he has been in it. He walked through it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11 says, or excuse me, verse 14. So then, so since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. How encouraging is that? That you and I cannot find ourselves in a struggle, in a place of temptation that Jesus hasn't already been there. And I want to make it clear, he did not put on his God coat to overcome sin. We know Jesus was 100% man, 100% God, but the Word of God tells us that he laid down his, his godly place and picked up humanity. 
so that you and I would know. He, di he didn't say, oh, man, this sexual stuff is tough. Father, you should have told me about this because I can't make it through. So I, I, can you, can you, I need to put on my God power again. No, he stayed in the same place as you and I walking in this life, being in the place to say, God, would you fill me afresh and anew? Would you meet me in this moment of temptation? Would you meet me with your strength? Holy Spirit, I cry out to you to meet me, to lead me. He knows your struggle. So he knows your struggle in being able to identify with it. And then here's the other thing. He really knows it. Like this funny thing. He saw every meltdown I had in Orlando this past weekend. <laughs> I can't hide it from him. You know, like when I have these moments in prayer, like, Lord, I need to talk to you about Orlando. He doesn't, he doesn't go, what? What happened? You guys were having a, a family weekend. I just took, took the weekend off. I thought you had it handled. <laughs> no. <laughs> he knows it. You say, why is that important? Because we need to be reminded that he has not left. He knows the darkest, worst parts of our life. And you know what he does? He leans in. He doesn't leave. The next thing, Jesus will meet me in my struggle. Jesus will meet me in my struggle. Paul said this in Romans 7. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Now listen to what he says. This is chapter 8, verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. What, 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 do, we, what do we see there? Paul is saying the truth of God's word and the grace of Jesus Christ. Not running from the, the, the place of missing the mark, but in the moments of missing the mark, reminding himself there's no condemnation in Jesus. He invites me to know him in my struggle. He invites me to speak and to meet him in my struggle. 1 John 1, 9 is true every time. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. I want to read the, the full context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We read verse 18 earlier where Paul says, don't stand and fight, run, flee sexual sin. Verse 12 says this, you say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. That is true, although someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one, but the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does, for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Before he started into all of that in verse 11, he, he gives us the place of transformation. He gives us the place of the grace of God. He gives us the place that is our response. And as he says in Colossians 2, 6, as you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him. In verse 11, before he gets into all of these, these statements about sexual immorality, he says this, some of you were once like that, 
But you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and on the Spirit of our God. This is our response. We call on the name of Jesus in the struggle. The last thing I want you to see, Jesus gives strength in the struggle. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. And I want to end with this verse that we started with four weeks ago. Philippians 4.13, 4, it's a verse that fighters, boxers have on their trunks before they go out to fight. But it takes, it takes new context in the knowledge of how he is enough. In marriage, in singleness, in the struggle, Paul says this, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus promised in John 16, he said, be of good cheer. You're going you're gonna to have tribulations. You're going to have struggle, but be of good cheer because I've overcome them all. You know what that word in the Greek means? That word all, it means all. It means all of it. So many of us, we, we, we find ourselves in this struggle and we allow the struggle to be a voice for us that keeps us from the embrace of grace that God has for you. We allow the struggle and the, and the failure that we walk through and we, we know and we say, God, I, I know this is outside of your design and, and, I, and I find myself in it again. And, and, and we can be in this place that Adam and Eve were in, in shame and in hiding where God is saying, hey, who told you you were naked? Come back. Come back to the embrace of the truth of God's word and the grace that meets you, that fills you, and transforms you again and again and again. This is the story of our lives. This is what God invites us to, that in the struggle, he is faithful. In the struggle, he meets us. In the struggle, he gives strength, and he has provided a way to walk out. I want faith to fill your hearts today. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? And as we do every week, I want to put this question in front of you. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Today may be a day that, that you're, you're saying, I want to walk with God, but I felt like I was kept from it because I, I know how I think and I know what I've done and, and there's just no way God could be okay with me. There's no way that he would meet me in this place. And the Holy Spirit is here to tell you that he is inviting to, you to know him. He is inviting you to open your heart to him. He's inviting you to take the trauma and the places that have closed your heart to him and to say, Lord, I'm going to step out and trust with you. The places that your identity has been held in and, and bound by, the Holy Spirit is asking, would you allow me to be your identity? Because I've been there. I've conquered sin, I've conquered death, and I want to fill you with my power and the life that I have for you. So, Father, right now I pray for every single one. God, I pray against shame. I pray against, Lord, the, the voice of condemnation. And, God, I pray that you would fill them with courage to step out of hiding and to step into an embrace with you. Jesus, thank you for fulfilling the law and being the voice that said that you come in grace and truth. Lord, thank you that, that you, you're after our hearts. Lord, thank you for the inside-out work that you do. Holy Spirit, we open our lives to you. Would you meet us? Would you transform us in the struggle today? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.